our next speaker is Juliet Kennedy from University of Helsinki. She talked about the super variance of syntax and semantics in the context of Thank you. Thank you, Grigor, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this amazing semester that you have organized. So super variance in the sense of dependence, right, semantics determining the syntax, which I hope that will be clear, and this is, of course, going. Okay, so the question is, how to a few are presented with this semantically presented with objects or no syntax or logic in the background, how to recover syntax from that semantic information? Uh, so this is a question that's very urgent in the philosophy of language literature, but you can ask it in the foundations of mathematics context. So how, there, there are various ways you can specialize the question, but uh, one way it specializes is to ask whether under what circumstances a given model class has a natural or implicit logic or even a natural syntax. And a model class is, of course, a class of structures of the same similarity type, possibly a different cardinality is exposed by that respect. And this is part of a project I've been thinking about for a long time, going by the name Formulas and Prenet, in which uh, one can think about the degree of entanglement, <coughs> so I had this notion of entanglement of canonical mathematical structures with various canonical formal theories, in the sense that a small change in the syntax induces, or any perturbation in the formal framework can induce a massive effect while on the other hand large perturbations in the framework. The formal framework can have no effect on the object at hand. So this is a very curious uh, phenomenon. Uh, and the example I always like to use is this idea of zero one loss for finite structures. So um, these are for finite relational structures. The zero one law holds, whoops, so this is a probability that a random relational structure on the domain satisfying the first of the formula tends asymptotically to either zero or one. So that's, a, that's your zero or one law, but for finite relational structure, you have this asymptotic behavior. But as soon as you introduce function symbols, the zero or one law fails. So even the statement that a function has a fixed point is uh, equivalent to probability of e. On the other hand, uh, so, so of course, for the logician, the change from a relational to a, a theory with function symbols is a, is a very important one. But the idea is, from the point of view of the practice, this is an insignificant uh, move. This is a, a, a perturbation of the syntax that's not that important. I mean, we all teach, perhaps, we all teach things like topology and so on. You don't restrict yourself to relational language. On the other hand, many mathematical logics are indifferent to the underlying logic in which you're formalized in the sense that you can change the underlying logic to another very different logic, but the object stays there, it remains the same. Gerald's arrow, this is our work on extended constructability, is a very large class of logics you can substitute for first order logic, and L just doesn't move the state. Okay. So this is a kind of instability. Um, uh, it's very interesting. And as I say, in practice, mathematics is indifferent to these framework perturbations. So the natural language of the mathematician typically contains a mixture of logical. OK, so instead of uh, uh, tracking syntactic variation in this way, and of course, this is what logicians do. We track syntactic variations. The book I wrote was advocating a kind of systematic uh, approach to, 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 this, um, to this instability rather than doing it in a kind of um, on and off way. Okay, so, uh, so instead of thinking about that, I want to think about a class of the, the problem where you have a class of structures and there's no logical syntax <coughs> in the background. 
Now, model classes have a similarity, right? The class of all groups comes with a vocabulary, right? But this is not a syntax. This is this is the vocabulary. Okay, so I'm making I'm making that distinction. Groups, linear orders, fields, and so on. And the idea is to consider model classes in order to model the noise coming from the group. Okay. Okay. classes are fundamental. Okay, so I want to explore this question uh, uh, from, so I'm going to give you a lot of old results, some new results, and the question one can ask is whether having a syntax is part of the definition of a logic. What we think of this. Okay, so here's an example of recovering syntax from semantics, this is from the Tractatus. Here is a uh, here's the world, <laughs> the Trout of Wittgenstein's Tractatus. Do everybody knows? <laughs> okay, so uh, by the way, uh, Wittgenstein, of course, uh, probably more literature on him than any other philosopher who ever lived, with very few exceptions, you know, Plato or something. But if you ask, I ask people, what about the order of these, what does it mean, these, uh, it's right hand side here, and nobody's you know. Anyway, so here are the semantics, and here's the syntax. So, this is an example disjunctive normal form reading the syntax of recover syntactic Okay, so I'll uh, first answer to the question when does a model class have syntax? Well, when it's definable in a logic, the syntax. And uh, for example, the class of the orders is kind of the first of logic. Now, this may seem like a strange thing to say, but in fact, not every logic has a syntax. As Baldwin knows, as he also knows, uh, Shalas L1 kappa, this is a logic. And <coughs> it can be in one sense, it can be regarded as logic, but it doesn't. Well, at least not that we know. Not that we know. Not that we know. Okay, so uh, this is what I call the semantic point of view. So if you think of, uh, so a model class, you have a sentence with an object, then the class of models of that sentence will be a model class. Um, so here, uh, phi is, is in some sense reduced to its class of models. This is a quote from uh, Van Heinrich's paper, Logic is Calculus, mm -hmm. Logic is Language. He says the proposition to may as well analyze being reduced to a mere truth value. So here we can think of the proposition. Okay, second answer to the question, when does model class have a syntax? When a model class behaves as if it had a syntax in the sense of answer one. That is, if some consequences of having a syntax can be, can be detected. If it doesn't have those consequences, it probably doesn't arise. From a logic the syntax. Arise means meaning that the class is modified or bias. Okay, so the first uh, approach to the question or this idea of behaving as if you have a syntax is through this notion of spectrum. So uh, so the question is when is a model class definable in some interesting logic? It's useful to think about the cardinalities of the models class because uh, theory. Um, it's so here's a here's the definition of a spectrum. If we have a model class, we define the spectrum of the class to be the class of cardinalities of models. Spectrum of the class is the class of cardinalities of models in the class. Also Gil Sagi talks about the spectrum. She has a very beautiful Paper in the article <coughs> on Kelly, I forget the title at the moment, but it's in the bibliography. She also talks about spectra. She uses it in a completely different way. Okay, so, uh, depending on the class, the spectrum can be a simpleton, an interval, an initial segment, or something more complicated. 
Even the patterns of binary numbers of spectra of first order sequences is interesting. That's another topic. Here I'm interested in conservative infinite cardinals in the spectrum. So here's a picture for you spectra of some model classes, right? So the idea is to uh, at least make a distinction between where, where you have regularity and where you have irregularity. These all look like particular. Uh, okay. So there are some nice questions about time. Yeah. 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 What does it say? So exactly. That's a whole, yeah, that's connected. I, so I understand that it equals up to. Okay, so uh, so let's think about so the property of the logic, which uh, reflects some regularity, is captured, for example, by the Lonheim's Golem theorem. So roughly speaking, if the logic has a strong Lonheim's Golem property, then this will be visible in the spectrum. If every sentence in the logic, which has an infinite model, has also a countable model, then uh, every spectrum with an infinite cardinal in it also has a of zero in it. So we have a limited conservation. So here's the definition. Suppose the and D are classes of cardinal numbers. A logic L star satisfies on the CD if every sentence in L, which has a model of some cardinality in C, has a model of some cardinality in D. Okay? So school <coughs> first order logic satisfies L as this L of C. Okay. So here's a very simple. Sorry, what? I just want to do the Oh, I should have a watch. Yeah, but I um, maybe your, give me my phone. Your breath circulation is almost the same as mine. So. Give <laughs> me my phone. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So here's a simple observation. If a model class is definable in a logic with LSPD, then if there's a model in the class, cardinality in C, I'm just repeating the definition for you, then there's a model in the class with cardinality in D. On the other hand, if the model class contains a model of cardinality kappa, but no cardinality is lambda, then k cannot be definable in a logic with LSCD, such that kappa is in C and lambda is in D. So the point is, by looking at the spectrum, we can make inferences about its definability in different logics. Okay. So if we're given a model class K, but no logic in which it would be definable, and I will be talking about this trivial logic uh, later. And we can discern if the spectrum exhibits some regularity, then this will be an indirect observation, albeit not a proof, that the class is definable in a logic LLCD for some C and D explaining the pattern. On the other hand, if the spectrum is irregular, we may take it as an indication that no such logic can be found. I will talk about the spectrum for second order logic in a moment. So again, the spectrum gives implicit information about the possibility of finding a syntax for the class. Okay, regular and irregular. Okay, this is a necessary condition, but not sufficient. All right, here's a counterexample. If your class alpha plus alpha for alpha plus orthogonal, this has a nice spectrum, naming it all cardinalities, but it is not definable in L infinity infinity. So here we have unbounded conjunctions and disjunctions, and then uh, here we have alternating blocks of quantifiers, unbounded uh, in each block. However, it's definable using the game formula. Okay, so this is not sufficient just because given a spectrum doesn't mean we're defined. 
Okay, so let's just make some elementary observations. Step theory, any class of successors of regular cardinals can be the spectrum of the second order sentence. This is follows from Easton's theorem. And the fact that second order logic can detect whether you choose the capital is capital plus or capital plus plus for cardinals below the side. Okay. We can write a sentence which has models exactly in two of the capital equals capital plus. So again, if you specify any class of successors in advance, then I can arrange for that class to be the spectrum. Second order spectrum contains a measurable cardinal. It contains a stationary set of cardinals below kappa. This is the usual thing. We take a measurable cardinal kappa, the normal ultrafilter, uh, which is the spectrum of the second order sentence phi. Let's take a model of cardinality, uh, model of phi cardinality kappa. Take an elementary embedding. Uh, the ultrafilter is normal, so that small model is in there, it has cardinality smaller than I of kappa, so pulling back one of this cardinality smaller than kappa in B. Okay, so a measurable cardinal cannot be the smallest element in the second order spectrum. So we're finding restrictions, in other words, on spectra of second order Magador's theorem. Um, no, uh, so for example, uh, uh, the, the smallest supercompact cannot be, you cannot have a, a, a spectrum for a second order sentence consisting of the least supercompact in the book. Because as Magdal proved in his thesis, the lone hub Skolkotarsky number for second order logic is this. Okay, so, uh, so, so far, well, Easton's theorem gives a lot of flexibility for second order spectra. There are also restrictions. So, as we just said, measurable cardinals have to have an accumulation point, and spectra of second order sentence cannot live completely above the supercompact cardinal. There are other restrictions. Okay, so what's in the background here is this idea. I mean, Fine made this famous remark that second order logic is set theory. Sheep's and wolves, uh, sheep, wolves wolf and sheep clothing, <laughs> wolf and sheep clothing, right? But there's something pernicious about the set theoretical content of second order logic. Um, so this is uh, uh, this part of my project or project is pretty much trying to um, understand the set theoretical content of second order second order logic. And the idea is if it's pernicious, you're not going to get restricted. You're going to get something pretty pretty wild every everywhere, every minute in turn. Now uh, you know there's this question in the back of the complexity of this of the set of cardinal numbers. How do you yeah, how do you think about this? Okay, here's some structure for you. So uh, uh, it, as it turns out the complement, because you can quantify over predicates in second order logic, complement of the second order spectrum of the spectrum. This is observed by various people. In fact, the second One order. The previous. Yeah. So the last bullet point is what the problem asked about. Oh, okay. So yeah. I have that same sort yeah. of problem. Yeah. Whether MP is the same as well. It's um, related to. Uh, uh, what is it? The field, uh, what are these famous problems? Yeah, the uh, million dollar questions. Millennium problem. Millennium problem. Yeah. yeah, so the idea here is is in the second order case, spec not phi is the complement of the spec on the top. In fact, the second order spectra form an infinite atomic Boolean algebra. What are the elements of the Boolean algebra? They're equivalence classes where we say uh, two second order sentences are equivalent. They have the same. Okay, so there's a structure there in these spectra. Okay, here are some more observations. 
so I just noted that um, uh, uh, but any sub any subset of a beta is fourth thing extension in which L M is a, the L M is a second order spectrum. There's a second order sentence phi, so that if zero sharp exists, zero sharp is one one reducible set of all n, so that L of M is in spec phi. Here's the sentence written down here. If we let spec L phi be the cardinals kappa for which phi has a model of size kappa that goes L, then assuming zero sharp, if some cardinal L of n is in the spectrum, spec L, then every cardinal is because the L of n are in the circles in the L. Further observations. Okay, so uh, uh, this is this is a situation that's mathematically rich, right? There's, it's not wild and random. There are constraints, there's structures, and the idea is uh, if, as fine uh, remark, if the entanglement were a little, then you would you would not expect to find these kind of situations. Okay. Uh, yeah. The spectral Sorry. So what to see was spectra? Yeah. And just what you said. So uh can you have like uh I guess that there might be a true example, but uh, what's the example of two logics that are different but the same spectra? So logic in the same sort of things to it. Or is it okay? So the, so the question is here, what's so the, what, is that, is, what is what is you know what if you if you pick spectra of logics? Well, yeah, yeah, we're taking spectra of second order mm -hmm. sentences. Yes. Yeah, so not, not necessarily logic. Okay, okay, okay. So, an example where you have two different sentences with the same spectrum, yeah, that's true. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, there is an element, there is an element, yeah. So sure <laughs> So, any, any two logics with uh, uh, Len Haskell and Peter and Bad Omega have the same state. But of course, they can be completely different. Mm -hmm. Have the same spectrum in the sense that the sentences. Okay. The yeah, the set of spectrums. Yeah. Yeah, the set of spectrums. Right. I have a question. How could an entanglement be in a level? Well, is, doesn't this indicate some kind of intention? Well, it's, I mean, I mean, this was the view of second order logic that it was essentially set theory in, you know, in philosophy, uh, especially during, you know, at Klein's time. And there's a lot of attention paid to things like ontology and ontological. Commitment set theory is thought to be ontologically heavy, right? It's you have the ontological commitments and so forth. <laughs> Are, so set theory bad because so set theory metaphysics is heavy, bad. So you know second order logic. <laughs> so second order logic is bad because it has set theory. It's set theory. <laughs> That's, that was the ideology. We'll have an entanglement. I didn't hear from us first. Not that it matters, but I mean, the question was why is entanglement bad about it? No, I don't know. My question is how could there an entanglement be malevolent? Because it's sort of ah, okay. assuming some kind of intention. Mm -hmm. Intention by who? If you, if, I, I think you get the answer that um, yeah, if, if you are entangled with, with evil, then you are evil. But yeah, I mean, why would, I'm repeating to you the dogma of the time, which I think was quite suffocating, you know, for the study of second order logic. It's not a history of art. I mean, it's just, uh, I, hopefully, all of this is now not as important as it can be. Okay. So, uh, so that was this idea of spectra, and there, there are, to be sure, many, many hard set theoretical questions there. So, uh, uh, it's, this is just the beginning of the story. Okay, so um, I want to attack this now from a different point of view, the point of view of logicality. 
So when there's a model class of syntax, as I said, it's when it's definable in a logical syntax, or when it behaves, uh, behaves like a logic with syntax. Now note that every model class is definable in some logic because we can take the model class of the generalized quantifier in the sense of Lindstrom. So here's your generalized quantifier. It's the first order closure under the first order operation of this quantifier. And here's the quantifier. So you basically take the uh, uh, membership in the class as a Okay. Most people have seen this before. Here's your class. Here's a generalized quantifier. So the model will satisfy QK and XY by A if and only if this structure belongs to belongs to. Okay. And now the class is defined. Generalized quantifier or instant quantifier. Um, and again, as I said, you can take the atomic formulas and then close under your first order operations. And that would be a sort of minimal first order for that. Okay, so uh, this is a logic in the sense of being an abstract logic. So the concept of abstract logic is going to be very important for this talk and the next talk. So an abstract logic. Or just the logic is a pair LST, where L is S is simply a non non-empty set. We think of this as a set of sentences. And here T is a binary class predicate pulled in between uh, models and elements of S. So this is uh, T for truth definition. This is if the pair is in T, so this is closed under isomorphism. Elements of S are called L sentences, and T is called truth. So this is what an abstract logic is. So just just the weak requirement, not nothing else. Yeah. 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 A set of sentences is just mm -hmm. simply a set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here is uh, sometimes, and especially philosophers, I like to show this this picture. People get very mad when you talk about these quantifiers. So, but this has a provenance which is now fifty years. So uh, this was a meeting in Finland. This is Sekou Nyepinen, who went from. This was uh, Michal Kranitsky. This is Finn Jensen, and this is Douglas Hussle. Uh, this has a very beautiful provenance, actually starting with, with Moskowski. Reading it. Okay. So, uh, so the question is now, for an abstract logic, to have a syntax, we need to say what having a syntax means. You can simply list the elements of S, right? But that's not a very satisfactory. That's not a very satisfactory solution. The, set, the syntax of English is not visible. We can take the generalized quantifier as as we as we as we just did, and then you can think of K as the class of all models of phi for phi and S. This is uh, uh, this this logic will have the same definable model classes. Uh, hold on, what was L? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. L is the, the abstract logic. Yeah. Uh, have the same definable model class, but if a logic has a syntax, there should be other consequences besides generating generating the definable. Okay, so the natural idea is that syntax consists of a small number of logical operations which generate us in a recursive way. Uh, this is something that has been very important in logic at the beginning of Carnap. A lot of <laughs> the nature of syntax. Okay, uh, logical operations. So I'm going to talk about logicality a little bit. We have to talk about logical operations. These can be viewed as model classes. So, for example, whoops, disjunction in the model class, right? So, here is how you turn disjunction into a model class. Simpler, the class of unary models. 
So uh, generalized quantifier consisting of models M A, where A is simply an empty subset of M, or on the other hand, the class of models M A, where M, the interpretation of A and M is equal to all of M, on the side of syntax, these would correspond to the existential of quantifiers. Logical operations map semantic values to semantic values. We would call uh, uh, such a logical operation, such a local, sorry, yeah, logical operations map semantic values to semantic values. If we just think of operations mapping semantic values to semantic values, then we would call this a logical operation if it's closed under permutation. So this is the Tarski permutation and variance criterion that uh, he wrote a paper called What is a Logical Constant? And, um, or What is a Logical Concept? A Logical Concept is a variant under permutations of the underlying domain. That was his uh, suggestion. So uh, uh, for logicality. Okay. Now we get so so the logicality of the model class. Uh, we say the operation corresponding to the model class is logical to the degree that the class is definable in the mass logic. That is to say, a logic that is supposed to be in first order with respect to its model theory. So we wrote a paper called Logicality in Model Classes, and this was the this was the suggestion of the paper. So, as I say, permutation variance on its own is a uh, kind of questionable guarantor of logicality, right? It overgenerates. So, for example, the cardinality of the underlying domain will be classified as logical. <coughs> okay. So, uh, so, so far I've said the model class. Is trivial, trivially definable in FLO prepay, where this is your Lindstrom quantifier. Conversely, every class, model, class of models definable here, or we need in any abstract object. So the definition is closed under us. Okay, so here's a little theorem for you. If I have a class of models with the same vocabulary, then it's closed under isomorphism. If it's definable in some extension of first order logic by a general quantifier, we can only if it's definable in some. Okay. Corollary of operation is a logical operator, it can only be expressed in some logic. That is to say, the associated model class is All right. A theorem of McGee improves some logic to a very specific logic, namely L infinity and infinity. But we get a different definition for each cardinality symmetry. This is a very, um, a very important theorem in the literature on logicality. Van McGee. We've actually already seen this, uh, or something, something, something like it. So definition. A model class is cardinal, dependently definable, or CD definable in a logic if K lambda is L definable, L star definable. So if it's if it's defined, if it has a definition in each cardinal separately, then we say the class is cardinal dependently definable, if C D definable in the logic. So we have one logic, different definitions for each. Okay. So note that I'm Model class can be CD definable even in first order logic without being definable in L infinity infinity. So here's an easy example. Consider the class K limit of models where the cardinality of the, of the domain is either a limit, is a limit cardinal and the predicate is empty or is a suppressor cardinal. P is not empty. We've now defined this class in a first order way in every cardinal separately. So this class is CD definable in first order logic, but it's Consequence of the Long Hans Fulham theorem for L infinity infinity that this class will not be definable in it because we can move from a model of phi and then uh, the state of the predicate is, is non empty to uh, sub model 
of the apartment of National Violate the unconscious case. Okay, in any case, here's McGee's serum. K is a class of models of the same vocabulary, then K is closed on morphism. If now we could see the dependable in our own function. I showed you before disjunctive normal form. We had a truth table, we extracted syntax, right? So this is sort of very similar. We have all these models, we write down the diagram, and then we take the stages. Okay. So um, if we're asking whether the property of a model of belonging to a model class is logical or not, we're essentially asking whether the property of a model having, uh, or rather the property of a melody of a domain having a limit for a melody is logical. As I said, according to Tars it's now Tarski share criterion, so share, Gila share, kind of proved or generalized the Tarski criterion. As I should have been generalized. So, according to the permutation invariance criterion, it is logical. On the other hand, it's it seems really not not to be. So in, in our paper, the logicality of membership in K lens manifests about the ability to So uh, one can ask, is there a tamer logic than L infinity? Infinity, uh, so can we, that we can substitute for L infinity, infinity in the case here, closer to being first order in its model theoretic properties. If such were to exist, then um, the logicality claim in question would be strengthened by, its, by virtue of its pro proximity to first order. In fact, this can be done. This is the open theorem. So here's, uh, if we have a class of models of the same vocabulary, then um, the, uh, it is a model class if it's cardinal dependently definable in delta L infinity omega. So note here the omega. Here we have a delta operation. I'll be talking about the delta operation in the next hour. This preserves, uh, so this is a kind of um, operation, a closure operation on a logic that um, fills the gaps, for example, left by explicit definability in the sense that if a model class is implicitly Definable in the logic and it's explicitly definable in the delta extension. As I say, this is a promissory note. I will talk more about delta uh, operation in the next hour. But essentially, when we consider the delta closure of a logic, we focus on what the logic becomes and some accidental weakness. Just definition for now. A model class is said to be delta definable on a logic L if it's a class of redux of models of a sentence of, uh, of L and also of delta. Okay, so back to having a syntax. To say that a model class behaves as if it had a syntax is to cash out behavior in terms of consequences. So what have we said so far? It has a nice spectrum. It has low and high school on properties of some sort. It has completeness theorems of some sort. So this is what it means to behave as if you have a syntax. Uh, low and scholar type properties in particular are uh, of interest because um, here we obtain some kind of indifference to cardinality. So having a low and scholar property is uh, a marker of logic. Okay. Compactness, truth theory, set theoretical absolutes. Okay. Here is a candidate for a strong moment of scholar property. So here's an old theorem of Lindstrom. We say that a model class is reducible if membership in the class is witnessed by a club of countable subsets so that uh, there, these, uh, these are redux of the model in question, 
to the set, and on the other hand, non-membership is witnessed by a public family. Okay, so that's reducibility. Model class is reducible. Membership in the class is witnessed by a fellow accountable subsets, and non membership is also. Okay. <clears throat> Lindstrom proved that if a model class is reducible, then every model class definable in this, um, what I've been calling a trivia logic, is reducible. This means that if, uh, uh, and so for such classes, we have this property that for every sentence of, if, if every sentence of this logic, we have uh, actually satisfaction is witnessed by, uh, similarly witnessed by a person. Okay, so it has, so this actually has a nice property. Okay, so that means that the sentence has a model, it has a countable submodel, and there are enough countable submodels to form above. There is some reducible logic. So knowledge about the reducibility of the class helps us to find a reducible logic in which it's defined. Now this doesn't have a particularly informative syntax, but reducibility in itself is an indication of possible definability in the system. Theorem, improvement. So here's this AA quantifier that we've been working on. So M satisfies AAS by if it's a club of countable less. This is the element of all quantifier. No, it's stationary logic. It has a completeness theorem and it's countably compact. And here's a theorem, the model class is reducible, then it's definable. So instead of a Lindstrom quantifier, we have a, a somewhat more informal example. So who did the angle cause? Oh, and here's omega with this. Yeah. Okay. And again, the proof. Just up, just on the normal form again, right? You write down the diagram, build the models in question, and then you take the space. Now that's the simplifying. Okay, so that's logicality. Here's a question for you. We have, we're thinking about model classes and the question when they have syntax, is that theory the syntax of the class? So you can always view a model class as a set theoretic object, in, in fact, first order set theory, right? So this sentence you and hey, there will be a first order formula in the language of set theory and uh, a distinguished parameter. So if k is mod phi for phi and some logic L star, then of course we will have this. Uh, so here the parameter is, is just a formula. So in case it is definable, right, it's mod phi for phi and some logic L star, then, oops, yeah. So here the set theoretic definition is just this formula and the parameter. Okay, so the idea is we can always view a model class as a set theoretic object. So is epsilon syntax of uh, the set theory the syntax of model class. Here's this uh, uh, notice set theoretic definability will always add epsilon to the vocabulary of the plot of the uh, L star of the class, I mean. I, I, it shouldn't be an L star, but it should be a class. Okay, and the idea is. We view this as a kind of external definability. Here we view this as a kind of internal. So this formula looks at the class from the inside. Here we're looking at the class from the inside. Okay. So uh, what is the relation between this external sub-theoretic definability and this uh, internal definability? That is to say, we have a formula looking at the class from the inside formula of some logic, 
And this is symbiosis. So this is from the thesis, 1979. This exactly relates this internal definability to external definability, that is to say how the model sits in the subtheoretic universe. Okay. The same once again. If in the class we actually have a sentence uh, in a logic defining the class, then of course membership in the class is witnessed by satisfaction of that formula, is witnessed by the set theoretic definition of the class, where it is uh, here, uh, the parameter it is the formula. So again, phi looks at uh, the model from the inside, and the set theoretic definition is outside I could have the year. <coughs> okay. So um, this was invented in order to uh, answer the question, why is a second order logic, why does it fail to be absolute? By this is a truth definition, it depends on the, uh, it's not as, as a relation, it's not absolute, it depends on the model set theory. So what keeps second order logic from being absolute? And uh, in the language of symbiosis, and I'm going to talk about this in the next hour, the non-absoluteness of the relation, uh, uh, the, the power set operation, is the reason why second order logic is not absolute. And I will, I will explain this. Once we adopt our absoluteness, that is to say, once we hold the power set operation fixed, second order logic becomes absolute. I will explain to you what this means in the next hour more precisely. On the other hand, second order logic sees the power set operation and can talk about it and everything else that is absolute with respect to the power set operation via its definable model. <laughs> the absoluteness of second order logic means that the satisfaction relation is absolute for transitive models of set theory when the power set operation is designed. Of course, second order logic is going to be one OK. In other words, the power set operation is symbiotic with second order logic, and this is what you would expect. OK, so here's a chart for you. So the idea here is that a model class has the inside definability property on the left, so it's definable here if and only if it's a definable um, um, in, in, in first order set theory, or it is uh, delta one, this is power set, here is the cardinality um, predicate, delta one p, so del delta one kp, so Kripke Platek, this is set theory with restricted, um, restricted uh, replacement and comprehension to restrict the delta one formulas, first order logic is symbiotic with this quite weak, so this is kp, uh, kp minus is pretty plus with alpha power set and order. So in the next talk, right, so here we have first order logic here, we have first order logic here, we have this thing called sort logic, which so I will, I will. So, so the paradox of first order being here and first order being here is the subject of the next uh, lecture and our paper called How First Order is First Order Logic. Sort logic. So, okay. So here, the idea here is that this degree of symbiosis is it measures, in a sense, the, uh, the difficulty or the complexity of uh, the, the difficulty of finding a syntax for the model class. So that's the sort of philosophy here. The complexity of the set theoretical definition is an indicator of the difficulty of finding a syntax for the model class, and we see that. Yeah, so these, these are all fragments of set theory. And so the, the complexity of the, of the set theoretic definition it tells you how hard the problem is. Okay, sort logic 
what is sort logic. In second order logic, you guess a subset of the domain of the model. In sort logic, you guess the domain outside the model and you guess a subset of that. And again, I will talk to you about that. Minutes. Okay. So we say that a logic is symbiotic with the predicate P of set theory. So for example, we've been thinking about um, we've been thinking about power set operations. So here's the definition. So uh, belonging to the language is generalized by our equal sigma one P, and the uh, satisfaction is delta one. Okay. So here's one side of the symbiotic relation, so we say L is symbiotic with P. And these two things happen, and on the other hand, a certain canonical model class associated with the predicate is definable in the delta extension. Okay, and once again, a model class is said to be definable in the delta closure of a logic, it's a class of redux of models of a sentence of L and L. Okay. I had a talk with, uh, of course, this being a spin theory group, right? In in terms of um, in terms of absoluteness, of course, second order logic of the naturals is absolute. Uh, is is generically absolute. Well, it has wooden particles, right? This is because we phase the theory of L over R. So, Okay, finally, another uh, approach to this um, question of finding a syntax for a model class or finding a syntax from a, um, from a uh, semantically presented object. So, uh, or if you like, right, we're given some kind of raw semantic data for example, the spectrum of the class, how do we extract syntactic information? So we should think about games. So if we have a logic, we have an elementary equivalence relation for the logic. What is very familiar to us? So here's a question for you. Very beautiful question that Yoko asked uh, one day when we were talking about this. Suppose we're given an arbitrary equivalence relation on structures close on morphism. Does this arise from a logic? Okay. So in other words, is there a logic so that uh, the equivalence relation is the elementary equivalence relation? Okay. That's another way of asking whether we can extract or another way of extracting a syntax from a semantically presented. Okay. There's another trivial solution, right? We can simply, in a way that's kind of reminiscent of the Lindstrom quantifier, we can simply write down, um, uh, we can write down a logic, right? Here are, uh, in, in fact, Yoko just asked the question out of the blue, but in fact, this is something that the finite model theorists have, um, have been asking about finite from the short. So, uh, so let's see, if we have two finite graphs, D and H, they're isomorphic, if and only if for every finite graph, F, we have the cardinality of the homomorphisms, F to G is the same as the cardinality of the homomorphisms, F to H. This is uh, Lobash. Let's call the left profile of the graph, the infinite vector consisting of all homomorphism counts. As if, as if there is a row on my graphs. Restricting it to a certain class C of graphs, let's consider the following equivalence relation. Two graphs are equivalent if and only if they have the same left profile that's different to C. So Dvorak shows that if we take a class of all graphs, this is a technical notion to treat with. Class of all graphs of trees with the most k, then the associated equivalence relation is elementary equivalent in k minus one variable first order order with common quadrant. So they actually they actually are thinking about this question. Also, Fokio and Politis has uh, has some very beautiful uh, results on, on this. So 
And I think this, I asked Lobash if this theorem will generalize to um, the infinite setting, and he said something which I should have written down, and I, I didn't. <laughs> it, was, it was that field medal celebration in Helsinki. Everyone was very excited, rushing the stage to talk to the field medals. Okay. Uh, thinking about games, shall here, I, I referred at the beginning of the talk to uh, logics or to the idea that a logic doesn't necessarily come with the syntax. So here's an example of one such, maybe you've been hearing about it. Uh, this is Stella's logic L1 kappa. It has interpolation, so in, this, in, the, in the semantic sense, uh, yeah, here you are. And it satisfies a kind of long time to school on theorem. And it uh, is the only strong object of interpolation besides L and omega, one omega. Moreover, it's maximum with respect to uh, the one of solar and undefinability of what order coming from patterns. So it's, it should remind you of Lindstrom's theorem, which characterizes first order logic as the maximal logic that is compact and satisfies the time. So the logic, if you want to call it that, it has no syntax, but it has a criterion and elementary equivalence given by a game. That is to say, there's an equivalence relation there, and uh, with the property that a player two has a uh, winning strategy, and, well, there's an equivalence relation there in a game, so that if a player two has a winning strategy in the game, then the structures are equivalent according to that. Okay, so for Shiva, I think it's very interesting philosophical issue, right? It has this criterion of elementary equivalence given by a game. When is it? So it's a logic according to Shiva. Shiva also it's, this is a logic. So uh, many people are involved in trying to find a reasonable syntax for this logic. Uh, here's a list of some of them. Here, giving might be a student. She has. Um, Done some very nice work on this, uh, Boban and Yoko, on this really is. Of course, the game paradigm of logic is So uh, we just heard a talk by Samson Bramsky. If you're if you think this idea of a game is uh, it's it's a really <coughs> quite loose and informal, I mean there is a sort of in category theory we can make our talk about. Are you motioning to me? No, that's <laughs> easy. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, so these are various approaches to the question. So I wrote this book, uh, examining what I call the semantic point of view, trying to talk about the entanglement of structures with uh, foundational formal languages. So here we're kind of continuing, continuing that work, but simply dropping, uh, dropping this part. We're simply starting with raw semantic data in the form of a game or a spectrum or uh, logical operation, and uh, you know, let's see. Okay. Thank you. I have a very uh, ignorant question. Um, okay. So how, how does this, uh, if at all, relate to like abstract elementary classes and what those people? Yeah, are yeah. So it, it does. It does. So these AECs. So you put closure conditions on one classes, and then you actually have a presentation theorem, which tells you, uh, which gives you a logic in which the classes are common. So, so yeah. Like foundation. I'm getting rid of those. Yeah, the word is, and you and in a way, to answer this question, you have to put some conditions on them. But these abstract elementary classes, they have a lot of, I mean, they have this um, nomination properties and all kinds of yeah. properties. So, that, and basically, you do the same thing. You write down the diagram of every model in the class, and you take this. Of course, there's, you know, that's very complicated and difficult because you have all this but yeah, the AECs are part of the story for sure. Here is my book. Here is my book. Right here. Speak again.